Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to follow up on Sven's excellent talk to, to discuss very briefly um, some of the functional materials that we're working on in, um, in my group. Uh, there we go. I'd like to start out by talking about the science of synthesis. In our group, what we do is we make new materials, things that aren't known yet. Uh, I joke that on a, on a really good day, we make something that's, that's interesting. Uh, how do we go about doing this? Well, there's a, a few uh, aspects we can think about when we think about making, making new compounds. And the idea is knowing where to put the atoms and how to put them there. This is actually very difficult if you're wanting to talk about how do I make something new that has a specific property that we'd like to exploit. So we talk about design. How do we create or synthesize a new material with desired functionalities? We want it to do something. And there are all sorts of design paradigms out there. There are these material design strategies. There's something called retrosynthesis, crystal engineering. You talk to a synthetic chemist, and each one will give you five or six different ones. Oops. There's synthesis. There's dozens of ways of making new compounds. We're solid state chemists. So we do things not in the liquid or the gas phase, but in the, in the solid phase. So usually a ceramic method, which is the solid state. Sometimes we use. Um, low temperature solution techniques, hydrothermal, transport flux. Again, there, there are literally hundreds of ways of making, making new, new compounds. What's the state of the material? Is it going to be in the bulk? Is it going to be a glass like that was just discussed? Is it going to be a crystal? Is it going to be a thin film? Is it in the nano state? All of these things determine how you make the material as well as what kind of properties that you get. And finally, the functionality. Are the functionalities just simply academic? Is it just something that we're interested in because they're interesting? Or is there any technological relevance? Are there energy relevance, communication, medicine, et cetera? So all of these, these four groups come into, come into our mind when thinking about how we're going to create something, something that is new. Oops. We have three main areas of research. And I'm going to be talking mainly about the first two. One are these new polar oxide materials. We do crystal growth. And these are large crystals, a centimeter size. And we have this area in multifluoral chloride, which I won't have time to, time to discuss. Okay. This Venn diagram is something that I came up with um, when I was in graduate school back in the 90s. Um, the information on here is actually known in textbooks, but I just put it together and it's sort of an, an easier way of looking at the interrelationships between various, let's call them acentric crystal classes. And if I put some compounds on here, it may, may help understand this um, diagram just a little bit. Let's start on the far on your left. So these are things that are chiral. And when we say things that are chiral, your hands are chiral. You can't put your right hand in your left glove. These have a non-superimposable mirror image. And if something is chiral, it may have interesting um, pharmaceutical applications. It may rotate light a certain way. The solid state example of chirality is simply alpha quartz. This here, alpha quartz. So this has a handedness. There's a right hand and a left hand for alpha quartz. If we take the other side of the diagram, these are materials that are polar. And if you notice, these here are not in the same oval as the chiral one. So these don't have a handedness. But what they do have is a macroscopic polarization. So the material itself has a, the, the charges are separated in the compound. So a molecular example of polarity is simply water. Water is polar. The, there's not an equal distribution of charge in the water molecule. In the solid state, we have some famous compounds up here, some of which are used in laser technologies, things like KTP. This is actually called the banana phase. Believe it or not, it's used in computer dielectrics. Um, barium titanate here has been known since uh, 1946. Um, it's used also in, in, in ships. So these polar materials is one thing that we're interested in because once you make something that's polar, you also have these other properties that come into play. And just for completion, we have things that are neither chiral nor polar. So materials like these neither have a handedness nor a polarity, but they still exhibit other acentric properties that we like. And finally, just a compound that exactly exhibits everything. OK. So why do we care about polarity? What does it do for us? Well, there are some very important functional properties that are associated with the material being polar. And these are things like second order nonlinear optical behavior or second harmonic generation, SHG, piezoelectricity, pyroelectricity, ferroelectricity, multifrog behavior. And I'll, I'll define all these terms in, in terms of what they do. SHG, you're basically halving the wavelength or doubling the frequency of laser radiation. In green laser pointers, there's actually a crystal in there that will take the red light and double it into the green. 
and this is quite, quite common. Um, and this can be commercially bought. The interesting part about SHG is they're looking for materials that can double things even further into the UV. Can you get down to under 200 nanometers, make something that's deeply blue from, from the crystal? Piezoelectricity, conversion of mechanical or electrical energy to electrical or mechanical energy. There's a piezoelectric in my microphone. It's taking the acoustic energy from my voice and converting that. Um, and this is used, this is used well by the US Navy in sonar applications. So there are all sorts of applications where you're converting one sort of energy to another using a piezoelectric material. Pyroelectricity is a change in temperature that creates a temporary voltage. This you can imagine being used in a uh, burglar alarm. The room is at a certain temperature, a human body walks in, the temperature changes, there's a voltage change in the pyroelectric material, an alarm gets sent off. This is how the basic concept of a, a burglar alarm. Um, and these are materials that actually can do this, and these are all polar compounds. And finally, a ferroelectric, the polarization is reversible in the presence of an external electric field. Now, pyroelectrics and, and ferroelectrics are related. All ferroelectrics are pyroelectric, but the converse isn't true, and in most cases, um, pyroelectrics are not. The polarization is, is simply just frozen. Okay. Multiferroic behavior, we have some magnetism along with, with ferroelectricity. Okay. What can we do once we make these compounds? Well, as I said, there are a few measurements that we do in our lab. Second harmonic generation, piezoelectricity, pyroelectricity, and ferroelectricity. If we take SHV, again, we're having the wavelength. This is a large um, inorganic crystal. You see here you have this red laser light impacting on the crystal and coming out is half the wavelength or twice the frequency. You have red light coming in, you have green light coming out. And these only occur in materials that, are, that e exhibit SHG. And there's a small class of these compounds that do this. And all polar materials will exhibit this, this phenomenon. Piezoelectricity, conversion of mechanical to electrical or electrical to, to mechanical. And here the idea is you can imagine, and this is just a, a prototype, where you have people walking on a crosswalk. They're given a certain, there's a certain amount of mechanical energy is being, being created. The piezoelectric material, which is something that we try to make sitting here, converts that to electricity and that can be taken into a street light or a, a stoplight or something. So just the normal acoustics and the mechanical energy that occur in everyday life is then transformed into piezoelectrics. And this is, the question is, what material do you use to actually make these panels? Is it environmentally safe? Is it cheap? You know, what exactly happens? And that's what we're interested in. We're interested in making these new materials. Pyroelectricity, again, as I said, is a change in temperature that creates a temporary voltage. And here, this only occurs when your temperature is changing. So your pyroelectric material here is shown in pink. You have a change in temperature, either heating or cooling, and you're creating a voltage which can then drive uh, a current. Now, this prototype was, which I pulled off the web, created by Oak Ridge Labs. Your pyroelectric material sits here. Above you have heat, here you have cold, and this cantilever motion basically moves the material between the hot and cold, so your temperature is always changing, though so therefore you're always creating electricity. Now this needs to be obviously ramped up to, to larger systems, but the idea is that your pyroelectric material is used in energy generation. In ferroelectricity, this is a little bit more complicated. These lines are supposed to represent electric fields. You're actually moving the central atom from the top to the bottom, and you get these um, hist hysteresis loops based on the ferroelectric uh, compound. Okay, so I said before, oh sorry. We've been able to do those four measurements in our labs now for several years, and because of this, people from all over the world send us samples, and we've been fortunate enough to collaborate with, with dozens of scientists. I probably get an email a week asking for our measurements, which we're happy to do. It's, it's really not, it's not, not a problem for us, so this is actually, um, uh, quite, quite a nice thing for us. So as I said before, we try to make things that are new. We're not trying to make the same thing again and again and studying it. We're trying to make new polar materials and then understand standard properties. And we exploit something what's basically called the secondary on Teller effect. And without getting into too much detail, basically what happens is instead of your central atom here, both shown in blue, being in the center of this octahedron, it's actually displaced toward a corner. What that does is that this unit, this octahedron, now exhibits a local polarization. And if you imagine this being linked three-dimensionally, left and right, up and down, all pointing in the same direction, you have a macroscopically polar material. And this is what happens in baryon tightening. This also occurs in another family of compounds. Here you have a cationic long pair. Your polarization is in the opposite direction. So we basically have cations that are in local coordination environments where a polarization is being generated.
Okay, and if you're interested, I can more than happy to send you these, uh, these papers. Over the past five years, I've had some exceptional students, and we've been able to make all sorts of new polar materials and measure these properties. And I know I have time to talk about these, but there's a, using, using the ideas that, um, that we developed and we built on from a, a number of other scientists, we've been able to, to create a, a whole family of these compounds. And so we think you know, we've really hit something here in terms of making new, um, new polar materials. Second area that we work on is crystal growth. And this is something now that um, in Europe is actually, is actually dwindling. There's an there's a, um, institute in Germany, the Leibniz Institute on Crystal Growth. There's one in Spain. And there's a few scientists here and they're doing it. But the main crystal growth right now is actually being done in China and, and, and Japan. And this is going to be a major issue because at some point a crystal will be grown that has extraordinary properties that will not be allowed to be exported. And then at that point you have to decide what you want to do. And so when I mean large crystals, we're talking things in the centimeter size. And these are actually, these, some of these crystals can take weeks, if not months, to grow properly. And once you do, you can do all sorts of physics, and as well, as well as chemistry and measurements on these things, which you simply can't do with a powder. And so this whole area is something that I think is really, is really ripe for growth, simply because it's been neglected for, for, for decades. Basically, large single crystals of new multifunctional materials are, are, are needed. Okay. In our lab, We've been able to grow crystals of these materials. Now, these are all new compounds, so things that we made first as powders, then finally as small crystals, and with the, the help of our, um, who I have one of the best crystal growers in the world, was able to grow these, these large crystals. And once I tell physicists that I have these large crystals, they'll, they'll beat, beat the door down above my office because they want these to measure. They don't like working with powders. They want to work with something they can actually physically touch. And for that, they love centimeter-sized crystals. I've had a number of postdocs and grad students when I was during my time at Houston who made all of these compounds, and they've all gone on to various academic as well as um, industrial careers. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I have a current postdoc with me is um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhang, who came with me from, from Houston. I, as I said before, I think he's one of the best crystal growers in the world. To tell you how good he is, he has turned down several professorships in China to continue to work for me. You can question his judgment, but you cannot question his talent because he really just wants to stay with me and, and just grow crystals. So I'm very, very fortunate to have him in my lab. Um, I always put this up as my last slide. This is my first graduate student. He's now a professor in, in Korea. We used to have these autoclaves where you needed this size of wrench to actually close the, um, the nut on the, on the autoclave. This is your normal size wrench you'd use at home. So, the, this is, I don't know what it is in metric, this is two and three quarter inches in, in US. The two questions I always get asked, how much does it cost and how much does it weigh? Okay, this costs roughly about 150 euros and you're probably talking seven, eight kilos. So it's not light, but you know, I wouldn't drop it on your foot. It's not uh, unbelievably heavy. Um, I used to joke that, oh, well, we'd never lose this, but believe it or not, back in 2005, we walked into the lab one day and this was gone. And it's not the kind of thing you leave behind a door and you think you might have misplaced. So somebody stole this. And I don't know what they did with it or why they would need it, but it's gone. In Houston, for better or for worse, you can actually go down to your local hardware store and buy this off the shelf. And if you're wondering if this is your baby and this is your adolescent, they actually sell wrenches that are about my size, about five and well, let's say, okay, almost six feet tall, I'll be generous. So, um, for all the oil drilling that they do in the Gulf. So if you ever want to see a massive wrench, it's still in Houston, um, come on by the lab. And with that, thank you very much and thank you again.